welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book, movie, compare, and contrast podcast. Allow me to introduce you to your podcasters. Us. Ellen, the punny, nitpicky, know-it-all host. Katie, the hilarious, potty-mouthed, snarky host. And seven times Harry Potter trivia winners. But we don't talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) We do talk about our rolling rehash. Last week, we discussed Chapter 5, The Whomping Willow and its corresponding film scenes. Molly might want to take a head count at King's Cross... Ron might want to take driver's ed. Harry might want to increase his life insurance policy. Arthur might want to increase his car insurance policy. The Whomping Willow might want to claim self-defense. Filch might want an antihistamine. Snape might want to chill the hell out. And McGonagall might want to work on her poker face. And I might want to work on how to pronounce Seamus. (laughs) Seamus? During episode 23, Sassy Pants and Sweaty Hands, our Potter pondering was, what do you think about Molly and Arthur going through the barrier before Harry and Ron? Quincy says that he wouldn't necessarily call it bad parenting, but that it was a bad move, and it always confused him as to why they would do it. Like us, he gets that it's a plot device, but personally thinks that it was a bad plot device. Yeah, Alice was on the same page, calling it rubbish and saying she understood why it had to happen for the story, but that she couldn't see an actual parent doing it. Carly points out that it was Ginny's first year, but she doesn't see why they wouldn't have sent the boys through and gone last. And Diana says that they should have sent Molly through with Ginny and had Arthur wait with the 12-year-old boys. Quincy posted this question up on a Harry Potter fan page for us and got a lot of responses back about it, too. Now, he took it a step further and called them bad parents for the sake of this post, so the responses were correspondingly a little more defensive. For sure. It seemed like a lot of parents really felt the need to come to the Weasley's defense, pointing out things like 12-year-olds can go through a door on their own or know how to get on the bus, that since the barrier wasn't supposed to seal like that, they were just supposed to be right behind them. Right, and I don't think that I would say that it makes them bad parents at all, for sure. I mean, we were more looking at the fact that it seemed out of character for them. Renee did have an interesting theory that maybe Dobby did some elf magic to convince them to leave Harry and Ron for last. That's an interesting theory. Right? I actually think this makes a lot of sense, because you would think that Molly and Arthur would have immediately realized that Ron and Harry didn't make it through the barrier. And this can really explain that. And if there was some kind of mind magic that happened to them that made them forget about them or not think about it, think they already said goodbye or something, this could really explain that. And I love that this isn't something that J.K. Rowling specifically spelled out for us, which lets it become such a great Potter pondering. For sure. But most of all, we just want to thank you guys for sharing your thoughts with us. We love hearing your opinions on things. And that'll bring us to our trivia question last week, which was, what school was Justin Finch Fletchley supposed to go to before he was accepted to Hogwarts? During the double herbology class that the Gryffindors had with the Hufflepuffs, we learned that Justin Finch Fletchley had his name down at Eton before he got his Hogwarts letter. And congratulations again goes to Quincy, though this was probably the closest I have ever seen two people answer the question at nearly the exact same time. Yeah, Quincy answered to take the win, and then Carly was literally a minute behind him. It was honestly probably less than that with how quickly the answers came through, but as far as we can tell, the timestamps round to the nearest minute. So, nice job to Quincy for winning. And shout out to Carly for coming so close. So close. Maybe next week. We are certainly seeing some people start to give Quincy a run for his money. This makes two weeks in a row for him, but considering that Alice got there first last week and Carly was right on his heels this week, he's really going to have to fight to keep his streak going. 
Especially since Dave is also always right in the mix and ready to make sure that we are declaring the winner fairly. He's okay with not winning himself as long as someone is stopping Quincy from winning every time. The more people that get involved, the less predictable it is who will win. And I love you keepers. You have really exceeded my expectations of what this trivia would become. This is so much fun. Definitely. And let's just keep rolling into Chapter 6, Gilderoy Lockhart and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 6, Gilderoy Lockhart. The next morning at breakfast, the post arrives, and any pride that Harry and Ron feel about showing up in a flying car vanishes as Errol crash lands on the table with a red envelope for Ron. At first, Harry isn't sure why Ron is so worried about the envelope, but then Ron explains that it is a howler. It begins to smoke while Ron opens it, and as soon as he does, Mrs. Weasley's magnified voice fills the great hall, telling him off for taking the car. Everyone turns to look at them as Mrs. Weasley's voice yells about the shame, her disgust, and Mr. Weasley facing an inquiry at work. The letter bursts into flames and burns to ashes, leaving an initial silence that breaks away to laughter and chatter once more. Harry is feeling immensely guilty, but before he can spend too much time dwelling on it, Professor McGonagall hands out their schedules and the trio head off to have double herbology with the Hufflepuffs. When they arrive at the greenhouses, they see a disgruntled Professor Sprout holding an armful of bandages and talking to Professor Lockhart. He greets the students and mentions he was telling her how to best doctor a whomping willow tree. Professor Sprout cuts him off and sends the second years to greenhouse three. Before Harry can head that way, Professor Lockhart intercepts him and asks for a word. He takes all the blame for Harry flying the car to Hogwarts, saying that he gave him a taste for publicity when he got him on the front page of the paper. Harry tries to protest, but Lockhart continues to say that he has plenty of time to be noticed, that when he was his age, he was just as much a nobody as Harry, maybe even more so, since a few people have heard of him with all that he who must not be named business. He says he knows it isn't as good as winning Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award five times in a row, but it's a start. He then gives Harry that award-winning toothy grin and winks before walking off. Harry enters the greenhouse and takes his place between Ron and Hermione as Professor Sprout asks the class about mandrakes. To no one's surprise, Hermione earns 20 points for Gryffindor when she knows the answer, saying Mandrake, or Mandragora, is a powerful restorative. It is used to return people who have been transfigured or cursed to their original state. And can also explain that the Mandrake is dangerous because its cry is fatal to anyone who hears it. Professor Sprout has everyone put on a pair of earmuffs that completely block out sound, and then demonstrates how to repot a Mandrake pulling on one of the plants and revealing an ugly, muddy baby that is clearly bawling. She puts it in a larger pot and covers it with dirt until only the leaves remain visible. She then has the class divide themselves into groups of four to repot their own mandrake seedlings, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione are joined by a Hufflepuff named Justin Finch Fletchley. He mentions how he knows who they all are, talks about Lockhart being so brave, and says how his name was down for Eton before he got his Hogwarts letter. They then put their earmuffs on and can't really talk anymore. They spend the rest of class trying to get the mandrakes into the pots, which isn't as easy as Professor Sprout made it look. After class, they have just enough time for a quick wash, then head to Transfiguration. Harry feels like he can't remember anything from the last year, as he tries to turn a beetle into a button, but Ron is having far worse problems. He patched his broken wand with spello tape, but it still isn't working properly and he ends up smashing his beetle. His mood doesn't improve when they head to lunch and Hermione shows them a handful of perfect coat buttons she made. They eat lunch and sit outside in the courtyard until their next class, Defense Against the Dark Arts. Hermione is reading Voyages with Vampires as Harry and Ron discuss Quidditch, until Harry realizes he's being watched by a small mousy boy who blushes and introduces himself as Colin Creevy. He says that he's in Gryffindor too and raises his camera hopefully, asking for a picture to prove he met him. He begins to ramble about how Harry survived you-know-who, and about developing the picture and the right solution so it moves and asks if he would sign the picture too. Unfortunately, Draco Malfoy is nearby and starts making fun of Harry, announcing to the crowd that Harry Potter is giving out signed photos. 
Gron tells Malfoy to eat slugs, but before a full fight can break out, Lockhart shows up and offers to pose with Harry for a double portrait. He then walks Harry to class and tells him that he was covering for him so he doesn't look too arrogant, and no amount of stammering on Harry's part convinces him otherwise. They arrive at his classroom, and once the whole class is seated, Professor Lockhart introduces himself, congratulates them on buying his whole set of books, and then gives them a quiz to see how well they read them. It was full of questions only about Lockhart, and after a half hour, he collects them and realizes that Hermione Granger is the only person who got all of them right. He awards her 10 points and then dramatically claims that he's going to arm them against the phallus creatures known to wizard kind before revealing a cage of Cornish pixies. Seamus isn't very intimidated by the pixies, but Lockhart says they can be devilishly tricky and opens the cage. Pixies shoot everywhere, causing chaos, wrecking the classroom, and lifting Neville Longbottom in the air by his ears and leaving him hanging from the chandelier. Professor Lockhart says pesky pixie pester nomi, and nothing happens. A pixie seizes his wand and he dives under his own desk just as the chandelier gives out and Neville falls. The bell rings and everyone rushes for the door. Before Harry, Ron, and Hermione can leave, Lockhart sees them and tells them to catch the rest for him. He then walks past them and shuts the door behind him. Ron and Harry are less than impressed with Lockhart, and Hermione tries to defend him, saying he's just giving them hands-on experience. She immobilizes two pixie with a freezing charm and mentions all the amazing things Lockhart has done. Ron is doubtful that he actually did any of them. This section of the movie starts out panning over the castle and into the greenhouses. Professor Sprout enters and says good morning and welcomes them to Greenhouse 3. She tells them that they are going to repot mandrakes and asks if anyone knows the properties of the mandrake root. Hermione is the only one who raises her hand and recites, Mandrake, or mandragora, is used to return those who have been petrified to their original state. It's also quite dangerous. The mandrake's cry is fatal to anyone who hears it. To Harry and Ron's delight and Malfoy's displeasure, Professor Sprout awards ten points to Gryffindor. She goes on to explain that their mandrakes are seedlings. Their cries won't kill yet, but can knock them out for several hours. She instructs them to put on the earmuffs for auditory protection. Then goes on to demonstrate how to grasp the mandrake, pull it out, put it in the other pot, and add a sprinkling of soil to keep it warm. As the students all watch her work, Neville faints. Professor Sprout thinks he was neglecting his earmuffs, but when Seamus explains that he just fainted, she says to leave him there and continues teaching class. The students all grasp their mandrakes and pull them out of the pots, creating a chorus of high-pitched crying. Malfoy tickles his mandrake and it bites his finger. The scene transitions to nearly headless Nick, who greets Percy and Miss Clearwater in the corridor before gliding into the Great Hall, where Ron is attempting to tape up his wand convinced he is doomed. As Harry confirms this, they are interrupted by Colin Creevy saying hi and blinding Harry with a camera flash. We hear an owl screech and Dean says, Ron, is that your owl? As Errol flies in and crash lands on the table to everyone's laughter. Ron nervously removes the letter from his beak and Seamus announces that Weasley's got a howler. Everyone laughs some more and Neville encourages him not to ignore it. As Ron opens the letter, it begins to scream at him in his mother's voice, telling him how disgusted she is and how it is his fault his father is facing an inquiry at work. Her voice lowers and the anger ebbs as she, to Ginny's embarrassment, congratulates her for being in Gryffindor. The letter then blows a raspberry at Ron and tears itself into pieces. Everyone looks a little traumatized and the scene shifts to the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. Gilderoy Lockhart enters the room and introduces himself as their new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. As he descends the stairs and walks past a portrait of himself, painting himself, he shares that he has an Order of Merlin, third class, is an honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League, and a five-time winner of Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award. The girls all swoon and the boys all look significantly less than impressed. After a bad joke that no one but Lockhart actually laughs at, he informs the class that it is his job to arm them against the foulest creatures known to wizard kind. He taps his wand against a covered cage, which starts to rattle. 
He tells them they are safe in his classroom, and as he removes the cover from the cage, he asks them not to scream, as it might provoke them! The cage is filled with little blue Cornish pixies that Seamus and the rest of the class are not remotely scared of. Professor Lockhart calls them devilishly tricky little blighters and opens the cage to see what they can make of them. The pixies dart everywhere, throw books, and grab Neville by the ears, lifting him up into the air and hooking him on the chandelier. Harry uses a book to knock a pixie off of Hermione's hair, and Lockhart flourishes his wand, saying, Pesky pixie pestinomi, only to have his wand taken by a pixie. The pixie taps the wand against the chain, suspending an animal skeleton in the air, and Lockhart bolts back up the stairs to his office. Just before shutting himself in, he asks the trio to take care of the rest of them. Ron isn't sure what to do, but Hermione stands up and says, Immobilis! and freezes them all mid-air. As they float around, Neville looks down from the chandelier and wonders why it's always him. Why is it always him? Poor Neville. Poor Neville. I think the most noticeable difference between the book and the movie for this episode is that they have the scenes in a slightly different order, as well as some other minor changes. Mm -hmm. The book starts out with everyone in the Great Hall for breakfast and Errol crash landing onto the table with the howler for Ron. Mm -hmm. Then Professor McGonagall hands out their schedules and they learn they have double herbology with the Hufflepuffs. And that's where the movie scene starts right in, during their herbology class. Although they don't have it set up to be only with the Hufflepuffs, because they have Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle in the scene. So obviously, Slytherins are present as well. Yeah, I don't think that the movies split them up the way the books did. I think they pretty much just had all the second years take their classes together. Yeah, which makes sense for a movie. I mean, to have all of the main kid actors present for the scenes that require a full classroom. It definitely makes more sense to do it that way, rather than have other random child actors just to fill in space. It doesn't really change the story to have Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle in the herbology class. Plus, everything else in the scene stayed pretty true to the book. Professor Sprout, who is kind of dirty, starts the class welcoming them to Greenhouse 3. Which is the same from the book, mm -hmm. except the movie skipped a scene where Gildory Lockhart was basically telling her how to do her job mm -hmm. by telling her the best way to doctor a whomping willow, like she wouldn't know. Right. But I do love that you mentioned Professor Sprout being dirty, because <laughs> not only does that make sense, working with plants and dirt and everything, mm -hmm. but in the book, they specifically mention how dirty she is and how immaculate Lockhart looks next to her in his turquoise robes. I can see why they didn't include this scene, though. For one thing, the movie hasn't yet introduced Lockhart as the new Defense Against Dark Arts professor, and for another, it doesn't... I mean, it doesn't add much to the story beyond some fun color about just how annoying Lockhart is. True. The uh, Whomping Willow, it doesn't have little slings around its branches in the movie. I always like that touch that they had to, like, fix it up in the book. Oh, well, they didn't really show it, the Whomping Willow, did they? They did. And it just, it was fine. Like, it, I was kind of missing the little having its branches in slings and shit. Just because it would have been cute. It didn't take anything away or add anything. I just, it was just something I liked. <laughs> yeah. The scene also cuts out a conversation between Harry and Lockhart, where Lockhart is convinced that he's to blame for Harry taking the flying car, thinking that Harry was doing it all for the attention because he gave him a taste of what it's like to be on the front page of the newspaper. <clears throat> and I'm willing to accept that this is also just fun color and isn't really necessary to the story, but it is a difference. It is definitely a difference. But after that, the herbology class proceeds similarly. Professor Sprout says they are going to be repotting mandrakes, and Hermione is, of course, the only one to know what the fuck a mandrake is. Of course. There is a minor difference here, as in the book, Hermione says that mandrake, or mandragora, is a powerful restorative used to return people who have been transfigured or cursed to their original state. In the movie, she specifically says that it is used to return people who have been petrified. So, I mean, thanks for the plot point, Hermione. Yeah, you know, right. A little foreshadowing for us there. Gee, is somebody going to get <laughs> petrified in this story? Hmm, hint, hint. She also goes right on to say that they are dangerous because the cry of the mandrake is fatal to anyone who hears it and then gets 10 points for Gryffindor. Why not? She says that in the book, too, but not all as one run-on answer. 
after she explains what a mandrake is, she gets 10 points. Mm -hmm. Then Professor Sprout asks why the mandrake is dangerous. Once again, Hermione is the only one who can answer, and that is when she mentions that the cry is fatal to anyone who hears it. It also earns her 10 more points, so in the book she actually gets 20 points total. But in both, even though the mandrakes are only seedlings and their cries won't kill anyone, they will knock them out for a while, so Professor Sprout has everyone put on their earmuffs to protect themselves. In the book, there was a mass scramble for a pair that wasn't pink and fluffy, and I really wanted to see that happen in the movie. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been really fun. But all of the earmuffs are pretty neutral. They're just mm, brownish, whatever. They put them on, and she shows them how to repot a mandrake. And she says, and I quote, this is a direct quote from her, grasp your mandrake. Giggity? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's dirty, right? It doesn't sound good. It's so dirty. <laughs> You thought I was talking about the dirt on her clothes earlier. No, Professor Sprout's kind of dirty. I'm just saying. She's dirty. It always cracks me up in the movie when Professor Sprout has them put those earmuffs on so they're protected from the mandrake's cries and then proceeds to talk through her demonstration of how to <laughs> repot it like they can still hear her. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe the earmuffs were enchanted to only block out the mandrake's cries but everyone could hear everything else. Like, you know, like noise-canceling headphones? Maybe, but that's not how it was in the book. When everyone is in their earmuffs, she pulls the mandrake, she grasps the mandrake firmly, (laughs) pulls it out of the pot, and Harry lets out a gasp of surprise that no one could hear. It specifically says that no one could hear. What? I wasn't listening. Sorry. Ha ha. Take your earmuffs off. Pay attention. I don't want to. Sprout completes the demonstration and gives them a thumbs up to remove the earmuffs and then gives them further instructions so they can work on their own. Yeah, the movie does just have her talk through it and it also adds a little drama and humor by having Neville pass out, which I think sticks with his character pretty well. Yeah. Uh, um, She thinks he was neglecting his earmuffs, but Seamus points out that he had just fainted and she says to just leave him there. Just leave him there. (laughs) <laughs> like he falls from well i mean he breaks his wrist but at least yeah. he gets taken to the hospital wing when that happens he faints and falls through and eh, just leave him on the ground it's just all right. leave him there he's fine and that that definitely didn't happen in the book she just tells them to work in groups of four and sets them to work and harry ron and hermione are joined by justin finch fletchley and before they put the earmuffs on he introduces himself and rambles a bit mentioning that his name was down for eaton which was our trivia question. Yep. But also not in the movie. Nope. Making sure we knew that Justin was muggle-born wasn't as necessary a plot point. Everyone just gets right down to work, firmly pulling the mandrakes out, <laughs> creating a chorus of high-pitched crying. Which was pretty awful to hear. Yeah, Juniper, my child Juniper, has started doing a mandrake scream when she's pissed. And let me tell you, I wish I had some fucking earmuffs. I love how because she's doing something that annoys you, you call her by Juniper instead of Ginny. (laughs) Either that or she's my husband's child. (laughs) She is your husband's child. My husband's child has started doing a mandrake scream. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully that's something she grows out of. Oh, good Lord. And hopefully it doesn't get worse and end up killing me. That would suck. That would suck. She, as she grows up and keeps screaming, it goes from just knocking you out. You wish it would knock you out, probably. Sometimes. <laughs> there are days. But anyways, let's just keep rolling. The book <laughs> has them put their earmuffs back on and get to work. And so they can't really continue the conversation anymore. And they find that it's actually a struggle to get the mandrakes out of the pots and back into new ones. They don't really want to come out or go back in. So mm. Sprout made it look really easy. Sprout does that. Um, The movie doesn't really show them repotting any of them. They all just kind of look around after they pull the mandrakes out, and then they show Malfoy sort of tickling his mandrake. Giggity. (laughs) (laughs) Right? I'm telling you. It's all over in this chapter. (laughs) But I love when the mandrake bites Draco. Like, what the hell were you thinking was going to happen, dude? You don't just stick your fingers in a screaming creature's mouth. Like, you just don't. Seriously. (laughs) What the fuck? But this is where the herbology class ends in the movie. So 
In the book, after Herbology, they have a difficult transfiguration class with Professor McGonagall. Harry feels like he's forgotten everything, and Ron's broken wand that he tried to repair with the ever so punny spello tape still <laughs> is not working. I still love that they call it spello tape. Like we talked about this in our bonus episode for the Sorcerer's Philosopher's Stone comparison um, when we when we went between the American and the British versions of the book. And the American version just calls it tape. But in the British version, it's cello tape, which is why spello tape, notice the P, is hilarious. I don't understand why you find spello tape hilarious, but yell at me for tree-capitating. I'm, so I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. You should already know better. I'm just saying. In the movie... They don't have transfiguration at this point. We will see Ron have trouble with his wand in transfiguration later, though. So we'll talk about that then. After Herbology, the movie transitions to the corridor where nearly headless Nick tips his head and greets Percy and Miss Clearwater. I love that he tips his head. Right? It's the best. (laughs) Also, having Percy with Miss Clearwater is a fun little nod to that mystery we were talking about surrounding Percy, the letter writing shut in. And we will talk a little bit more about this later on. Yep. The movie then moves us into the Great Hall, and Ron is spellotaping his wand. Even if the movie, sadly, does not actually make that joke. Colin Creevy blinds Harry with his camera flash and introduces himself, saying that he's in Gryffindor too! (laughs) There's also a deleted scene where Colin goes on much longer with his chatter, revealing that he is, in fact, Muggleborn. And on the way he says, everyone just thought I was mental. <laughs> it's just so, it's so adorable the way he's like an overexcited labradoodle. I love it. He, that's, yeah, that, that's pretty much. He's so freaking And cute. the way he, we'll talk about him later. But it, no, it was, it was awesome. I really wish they'd left that scene in. Mm-hmm. We will meet Colin this chapter of the book too. But since everything's slightly out of order, we don't at this moment of the book. Mm-hmm. This is also when it shows Ron getting the howler instead of before Herbology class. Yeah, it flipped the order of those two scenes as well as mixing up some other ones. But aside from that, they are pretty similar. Errol Crash lands on the table and Ron realizes he has received a howler. Neville tells him better not ignore it, that he ignored one from his grand ones and it was horrible. (laughs) Yeah, the movie adds in a couple of lines. We've got Dean Thomas, our resident one-line wonder, saying his, well... One line. Ron, is that your owl? Plus, Seamus gets to announce that Weasley's got a howler. The howler itself gets the exact same gist across, but it is slightly different. Parts of it are word for word, but the book version definitely goes on a bit longer. Yeah, plus there is the end of it, of course, where Molly congratulates Ginny, and it's it's classic Molly. Like, why waste a whole other piece of paper sending Ginny her own note? Let's just make sure everyone in the Great Hall knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> right? Book Molly just yells the whole letter, and then it bursts into flames. Having her yell aligns itself with how Molly yelled at Ron, Fred, and George for the flying car incident. And then kindly welcomed Harry. Yeah. Because like in the in the book, it's just yell, 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 kindly welcome Harry. Whereas in the movie, it was yell, greet Harry, yell a little more, talk kindly to Harry. Like <laughs> the way that she goes back and forth, you can tell that she's the mother of six boys and one girl. Yeah. Because she can switch from yelling to that calm, sweet voice. Like nothing. Absolutely. And a side note. I so wish I could send howlers to shitty people. Like, I'd probably run out of paper, but you, oh my you God, would. worth it. You really would. <laughs> I hope you never have to send a howler to me. No. I prefer to deliver your howlers in person. And fair enough. So you're safe at least until this quarantine's over. <laughs> at least. <laughs> Who knows how long that's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> but... Another slight difference is, in the book, the Howler bursts into flames and then burns to ashes. Yeah, and in the movie, it blows a raspberry at Ron. Which I always thought was so cheesy. I mean, I didn't hate it. it like, it was, it, it's childish, but it's funny. Like, it's a funny way to end a parental smackdown. 
But in the movie, it tears itself into pieces instead of bursting into flames, which I think is way safer because, I mean, bursting into flames is dangerous. They're kids. What if one of them catches on fire? The added risk of receiving a howler. Catch on fire and you'll certainly think twice before breaking rules again. <laughs> I'm just saying. Point. Point, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Mark it. Uh, <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> But then the scene transitions to the defense against the dark arts class. Obviously, since this was set up out of order, the transition isn't going to be the same. The book goes from the howler to herbology to lunch. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione are sitting in the courtyard. And this is where we meet Colin Creevy in the book. His deleted scene from the movie is actually pretty spot on to the book. With the wanting to take his picture and have him sign it and all the rambling. And aside from the order of appearance change, the only real difference is that in the book, Malfoy overhears Colin asking Harry to sign the photo and starts announcing it to everybody to embarrass Harry. Ron tells him to eat slugs. Which is what he uses to curse Malfoy in a later scene. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that then. I didn't get the impression that it was a curse in the book. It came across more like a kind of insult. I thought it was like a threat. Maybe. Like, oh yeah, Malfoy, eat slugs. Like, like he's going to slug him. Like a fist? Maybe? Like knuckle sandwich. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that could be it, because before anything else does happen, Lockhart shows up here, too. And it's just in time to hear Malfoy. And again, he assumes that he's given Harry a taste for fame and poses with him Ugh. to cover for him. So Harry doesn't look too big-headed. He's so cringeworthy. Like, he's just right? so cringy. But again, it makes sense that they didn't include this, as the movie still hasn't told us that Lockhart is the new Defense Against Dark Arts professor, even. Doesn't really do a whole lot to further the plot at all. Yeah, it just really lets you be annoyed with Lockhart oh, he's... and Malfoy. Oh my god, the two of them? They don't even know how bad each of them is. That's what makes them so bad. <laughs> but the movie still gives you plenty of those moments as well, as we know. True story. So in the book, Lockhart ends up escorting Harry all the way to Defense Against the Dark Arts, and then everyone else shows up. In the movie, everyone's already seated, and Lockhart gets to make his grand entrance from the office. Allow me to introduce you to your new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the movie sure loved doing grand entrances for the teachers. Expecting that all of the students would actually be in their seats waiting for the teacher to just show up. And I call bullshit. So, in, let me get this right. In a movie about witchcraft and wizardry, you have trouble with the kids being in their seats? My imagination can only take me so far. <laughs> I'll give you but anyways, once you get past Lockhart's grand entrance, which... Despite being different than in the book, I can't even be mad about it. It was so amazing. It really was perfect. Like, it took it took a lot of what was left out of the previous scenes that the book had him in and condensed it all into one bundle of pompous, self-promoting, like, bullshit. You know, when he walks down the stairs talking about all the things that he doesn't talk about and stops to pose by the painting of himself, painting a portrait of himself and... Wait, ooh, Lockhart-ception. <laughs> Lockhart-art-ception. Lock <laughs> That's actually one of my favorite parts, though, especially when he says five times winner, pauses, and then both he and his painting self wink. <laughs> I wish the painting that was inside the painting would have winked as well, though. That would have been a nice little touch. Oh my gosh, that would have been even more amazing. Although I don't know if the women's panties could have handled oh, it. Oh lord. <laughs> and his awful joke about not getting rid of the banshee by smiling at it, followed by the cheesiest, toothiest smile, <laughs> and then his laugh. <laughs> cringe. I, oh god. I cringe. It's... <sighs> Kenneth Branagh just, he nailed it. It really makes me wish that they had left in the deleted scene that included the quiz that he handed out to everyone. Because even like when he's handing out the papers, you can see you can see the writing. Even in the questions, he makes his name like stand out. Yeah, he like bolts his <laughs> yeah. name. It's a larger font. It's all caps. Like right. it's just like 
This is all about me. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's the defendant in a court case. Like, you need to be able to pick out his name on every question. Um, but it just, it, it cracks me up. Plus, the boys' reactions to the whole thing is just hilarious. As is the girl swooning. Right? And if they had left it in, then the scene wouldn't have been nearly identical book to movie. Because he even points out that Hermione was the only person who knew that his secret ambition is to rid the world of evil and market his own line of hair care potions. <laughs> is it a secret ambition if you publish it in one of your books, though? Not really. I didn't think so. Also, Hermione's probably the only person who got any of those questions right. Yeah, probably. It, it also got her 10 more points. So thus far in this chapter and slash movie section, well, in the chapter, she's gotten 30 points. In the movie section, she's up to 20. Yeah, for well Gryffindor. done. So nice job, Hermione. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then as soon as he gets to the pixie reveal, since they didn't have this scene in the movie, the two are back to being very similar because in both he's acting like he's about to show them something horrifying reveals the quarters pixies and Seamus is completely unimpressed. <laughs> yeah, it cracks me up in the movie how he says, I must ask you not to scream right before fucking screaming. Like it might provoke them. <laughs> <laughs> and like just the dramatic removal of the claw. Mm -hmm. And then he lets them out. Yeah. And then they dart around the room causing absolute chaos. In both, a couple of pixies lift Neville by the ears and hook him onto a chandelier. Yeah, but thankfully the movie didn't have Neville fall with the chandelier like in the book. Because, <laughs> poor Neville. I just, I feel so bad for him. Instead, they had a pixie take Lockhart's wand after he says, Pesky pixie pestinomi! And use it to break the chain on a skeleton hanging from the ceiling and send it crashing to the ground. The pixie was shouting, Yeehaw! As it rode it to the ground. <laughs> and I just love that. Just the fact that they threw that in was an oh awesome touch. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> that was amazing. And it certainly added enough drama without sending poor Neville crashing to the ground again. Yeah. Was that a Thestral skeleton? Um, I think it was actually a dragon skeleton. Because it didn't have, like, front hooves. Like, like a Thestral's, like a... It's like a horse with wings. Yeah. Whereas a dragon's got like the hind legs and wings. Yeah. It just wasn't a very big dragon then. I guess that's why I was thinking it might be a Thestral. Maybe it was a baby. Who that's knows? That's really sad. Yeah. I wonder if Thestral skeletons can be seen by those who haven't seen death. Because if they can't see living Thestrals, can they see dead ones? That's a really good question. Because I'd be inclined to think no, but then maybe because for them to be a skeleton, they are dead, that would counteract it in some way? We should make this our Potter pondering. Sounds good to me. But yeah, so the skeleton crashes to the ground instead of Neville, but has a very similar effect, causing the rest of the students and Lockhart to bolt. Of course, the book does have the bell ring, so they're like, class is over, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Right. <laughs> but it all coincides with the crashing of the large, heavy object to the ground. And before Lockhart leaves, he asks Harry, Ron, and Hermione to take care of the rest of them. Though in the book, he just runs out of the classroom after the students. Yeah, like a bitch. <laughs> well. and, in, and in the movie, he runs up the stairs to shut himself in his office. Like, everything about this scene is amazing, though. Even his painting is running away from the pixies and, like, <laughs> swatting at him. <laughs> Once the trio are left with the pixies, Hermione casts Immobilis and freezes every pixie in the room. But here's the thing. If she knew that spell, why the fuck wouldn't she have just used it in the first place? Like, you could have saved us all a lot of goddamn trouble, Hermione. And plus, why didn't it affect Neville when... He was, like, in the same area. Oh, yeah. Like, why wasn't he frozen, too? Yeah. I have no idea, because that's not how it happened in the book. Hermione does use a Mobulus, and she freezes two of them at once. So freezing all of them is just movie drama. And yeah. it can definitely, that kind of thing can make it more interesting, but it also just sometimes completely defies logic. The yeah. chapter ends with Hermione trying to defend Lockhart because the boys find him to be a complete fraud. wonder where they get that idea. 
I can't imagine. <laughs> the movie scene ends with Neville, who is still hanging from the chandelier, wondering aloud, why is it always him? Poor Neville. Poor guy. But this will bring us to the actors that we see for the first time in this film. And to start off, we have Miriam Margulies as Professor Pomona Sprout. This is also the first time we actually get to see her in a film. At all, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though she should have been in all of them. Right, she should have. <laughs> I love her, though. She's, Miriam Margulies is, she's an amazing actor. She's been in, she's been doing this for many, 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 many years. But what I love about her, she's like, she's like grandma goals. Like, I oh, want Oh my her... god, she would be the coolest fucking grandma ever. Right? She's foul mouthed. She's straight up. She doesn't like if you have ever watched interviews of her. She's just, oh, she's so goddamn funny. Yeah, we have like, a clip that we're we're gonna have shared up on the page for you guys to watch. It's an interview with her and Dan. Yeah, and it's it's just so funny. It's just so funny. She's she's fantastic. Oh my god, she's also exactly how I imagine Professor Sprout. To yeah, be. yeah in the book versus the versus how she actually was was pretty perfect and she just struck me as a gardener <laughs> <laughs> like that's totally a woman who likes plants like she was just such a hufflepuff right too. yeah that was i was just thinking that too i'm like she was the perfect head of hufflepuff you know yeah so yeah mary and yeah, she did she, was she did really great and like I said, check out that clip oh of her God. interview because it's hilarious. Let and us know you know what? what? You if you got spare time, just just do a YouTube search for her and watch other interviews because they're fucking yeah. shit too. <laughs> Everybody's got some spare time right now, so go for it. Right. You will be entertained. <laughs> we also had Hugh Mitchell as Colin Creevy, which, like I said, we already said we wish that they hadn't taken out his extended scene because it is just 100% everything that i imagined mousy little colin to be right yeah like he was just such a little spaz yeah. and, <laughs> and like if you guys haven't had a chance to see that deleted scene check that out too because mm -hmm. it's like i had forgotten about it like i know i'd seen it before but until we started working on this episode and i rewatched it i was just like yeah i forgot how perfect he was and he was just like they, i mean he was just described as being so tiny and mousy and just a total little spaz who's just like obsessed with Harry and even like the imitations in the book that they'd have Malfoy do of him. Like everything about it, that little kid just <laughs> like snowballed into one yeah. little tiny scene. And I was just like, he's perfect. He he's amazing. So well. Like that's totally he's just adorable. Creepy. He grew up to be to be quite handsome, too. Remember, remember, I think he was one of our on one of our trivias. Oh, yeah, we had a, a trivia round. It was a picture identify one where we had to identify the actors as adults, yeah. the kid actors, but now as adults. And some of them we were like, damn, yeah. and I'm pretty sure he was one of them. <laughs> right? Yeah. But he was one of the stumpers, too, because we were like, who the hell is that? Like, did Lockhart have a kid? <laughs> like, yeah, I think it was our friend Val who was like, dude, that's Colin Creepy. I'm like, no, uh yeah, no, Val was always good for random knowledge. Like snipering in with the yes. random correct answer we love like her. that. <laughs> and the unbelievably dirty and hilarious pickup Again. lines. <laughs> That's why we love her. That's why we love her. So next we had Alfred Enoch as Dean Thomas. Our, our, our one, one line, line wonder. wonder. I love him. I wish he was given more than one line, but I also in a weird way kind of love that he was only given one line just because I can call him a one line wonder. But yeah, again, he did wonderfully at his one line. Ron, is that your owl? Right. It was so just there was just so much Shakespeare within that. It was... Right. I felt it. Um, <laughs> it was in fact Ron's owl. So, <laughs> but as an actor, he's actually a really good actor. Yeah, it's. I didn't see it coming. Honestly, like it just honestly. makes me feel so bad when you've got these talented kids like you get to be dean thomas but you don't really get to do anything like you are just yeah we're gonna give you a line here you go yeah here's here's one line to up your pay grade that's about it like <laughs> poor yeah. guy but yeah he's a really talented actor and um he's just he's very sweet as dean thomas and i wish they would have given him dean thomas to be right well i think we there could have been so much more fun interaction between dean and seamus and mm -hmm. and i also think that like they could have used him to help develop Ginny more because oh, yeah of course like 
there's just so much of that that was left out of the stories. And mm-hmm. But speaking of Seamus, that's who's next. Seamus. We had Love Devin Seamus. Murray back as Seamus Finnegan. And um, I actually have this fun little headcanon theory that I don't know if this is accurate at all, but it seems to me like the directors loved him. <laughs> and I, I, so I like to believe that he auditioned to be Harry Potter and they were like, no, you're not right for Harry Potter, but we adore you. So we're going to make you Seamus Finnegan and give you all of these fun little ridiculous bits with blowing things up and setting yourself on fire. And like, I just, I, I, that's what I like to believe about him because like, he's just this like sassy little kid that mm-hmm. they gave him so much more than they gave Dean. But they were like the same level in the book. Yeah. So I just, that's that's my thought. I think that he auditioned for Harry Potter and they were like, no, you're not Harry Potter, but we love you. I feel like Seamus is like just this side of like a dude bro. (laughs) And I think, I think that Devin Murray played it, played him very well. I mean, not to say that Devin Murray is, is a dude bro, but just that he, he just played it really well where he was kind of. He was sarcastic, but he wasn't necessarily the class clown, but he could bring a joke when he needed to, you know. Cornish and, pixies. Yeah. He he delivers his lines very well. He gets very few lines. But he gets more than his best friend. He does. He gets more than Dean Thomas, but he does them very well. He brings he brings Seamus to life and we love him for that. Yeah. But that'll bring us to Matthew Lewis. I'll allow the ladies to sigh <sighs> here. <laughs> Insert Lockhart sigh. Right. Ah. <laughs> Swoon. Matthew Lewis as Neville Longbottom. As who poor Neville Longbottom. Is poor Neville Longbottom. And we love him. And he's he's adorable. He's coming a little bit more into his own in this one. But not much. He's still the bumbling. I mean, what did we get? We got to see him faint. No. We got to see him nervously tell Ron not to ignore the howler. Yeah. And um, we got to see him get lifted up in the air by his ears by some pixies. So not not his, but at least he did not his highest moments. At least he didn't fall from yes, that we chandelier. Did not see him fall. So that's nice. You know, or he hasn't broken his wrist. So again, <laughs> again, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now I I wonder why they made that choice to not have him fall again. Just maybe they thought it'd be too repetitive like oh he been there done that with this one let's do something different i don't know but he did do and always does such a good job just encompassing that bumbling Mm -hmm. lack of self-confidence yeah shy and nervous and yeah like i I mean i don't want to be mean but (laughs) Poor Neville is just kind of a screw up in the beginning. Well, I almost feel too like the way he reacts to the pixies putting him up on the chandelier when he's just like, why is it always me? I feel like he got on the Hogwarts Express this year for his second year going, you know what? I'm just going to stay in the background. (laughs) I'm just going to stay in the background. This year's going to be better. Things are going to be okay because I'm just I'm not going to draw attention to myself. I'm not going to do nothing weird. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to be afraid of sleep. Yeah, I'm going to avoid. I'm an avoider this year. I'm not going to break any more yeah. bones. And then what's the first fucking thing that happens? Well, in the movie, he faints in front of his whole class. You know, and then yeah. he gets essentially kidnapped by pixies. Yeah. Poor Neville. <laughs> so the poor guy. Poor Neville. <laughs> it's just, he's just one of the characters that I loved watching grow throughout the series and not just because i loved watching matthew Lewis grow but because like i just i can't even describe how much genuine pride i feel for a character because of his growth Mm -hmm. and and that's obviously something we will be talking more about as we continue through yeah this series but yeah matthew lewis did a fantastic job as neville even if he did start to grow out of the the description of neville from the book he still encompassed the spirit of neville throughout the yeah he did very well but that will bring us to our potter ponderings which as we've decided is can thestral skeletons be seen by those who haven't seen death so let us know what you think we'll post this up on the facebook page awesome 
And with that, we'll roll right into our sorting hat story. Ooh, I see what you did there. Yeah, I did a thing. It was a thing, guys. It was a thing. Hi, I'm Jackson Miller from Australia. I'm not going to do an accent. I you almost was tempted to. to. I I mean, if he's listening to this, you're just going to embarrass yourself. Ex- <laughs> Even if he's not listening to this, I'm going to embarrass <laughs> myself. But in my head, it's in an Australian accent. I'm just not projecting. Use your imagination, so. guys. This is Jackson Miller from Australia. Yeah, I'm Jackson Miller from Australia. I am a proud Hufflepuff. My wand is 13 inches, made from mahogany with dragon heartstring core. My Patronus is a kangaroo. You can't make this shit up, people. (laughs) (laughs) The first time I read Harry Potter, I was 11 years old. Hogwarts age. Coincidence? (laughs) Haha. I've always been a bookworm and was looking for something new to read. A friend of mine had just bought a new hardcover copy of Philosopher's Stone and decided to give me their old copy, and I was hooked from the start. I've owned about 20 copies of each book over the years, including what I have now, the box set of adult hardcovers, the illustrated versions, and the 20th anniversary house covers. Lucky. I know, right? (sighs) So jealous. (laughs) The first thing I'm doing when the COVID-19 crisis is over is planning a trip to the Wizarding World. Hey, us too. (laughs) Right? We're going to go in July for LeakyCon, assuming that all of this is over by then. But thanks for sharing, Jackson. We are so happy to have you join us. And as you heard, I love the fact that you are from Australia and your Patronus is a kangaroo. That's just, that's fucking amazing. It really is. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you for that and for sharing your story with us. And I just think it's so fun that you got to start reading it when you were the same age to start Hogwarts because I feel like that would only add to the magic. Definitely. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, the wood, the core, and the length, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Yes, please share with us. We love reading your stories. And this will bring us to this week's trivia question. Which is, how long was Harry stuck in detention with Professor Lockhart? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag fan mail will get a bitch is a witch, motherfucker's a wizard, a just keep rolling, or a pride sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you're an Apple person, you can do that through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 7, Mudbloods and Murmurs, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. rolling.